You belong to a primordial and brave nation that is not only worthy of praise and contemplation, but one which has also accomplished countless glorious deeds that we will mention in this book. Throughout Armenian history, there have been several times when Armenia was a superpower. As early as the 27th to 26th centuries BC, the culture of the Armenian highland had spread far and beyond its borders, reaching in the south, Syria and Palestine, and in the north, northern Caucasus. Later on, in the 23rd to 22nd centuries BC, for about a century, a coalition of 17 states of the Armenian highland ruled most of the Near East. In the first half of the 8th century BC, during the reigns of King Argishti I and Sarduri II, the Kingdom of Van, for about 50 years, was the most powerful state of the ancient Near East. Armenia also reached the status of a superpower during the rule of Emperor Tigran the Great, as well as during the reign of the Armenian Bakratuni dynasty, which extended its rule beyond Armenia to Iberia, Caucasian Albania, and Abkhazia, a territory which stretched from the Taurus Mountains to the Greater Caucasus. However, in the collective memory of the Armenian people, the most lasting impression was left by the sea to sea empire of Tigran the Great. Why is it so? In order to find an answer to this question, we must look closer into some of the events that shaped this era. During this period, two superpowers were trying to divide the Near East among themselves. In the West, slowly but surely, Rome was on the march and in the East, the Parthians had extended their domain all the way to the Euphrates River. Both powers wanted to establish preferable natural frontiers. It was in these circumstances that two new additional powers arose in the region that challenged the status quo established by Rome and Parthia. One of these was the kingdom of Pontus, whose king was Mithridates VI, Eupator, an exceptionally talented and ambitious ruler. Mithridates was fluent in more than 20 languages, including tribal languages, and had set a goal of establishing a powerful Hellenistic state. Tigran the Great, in his own turn, had plans of his own. He primarily wanted to expand the Armenian state in the south, east, and north. Tigran the Great was in the Parthian court as what is often referred to as a hostage. However, there is a good deal of evidence to believe that his status was somewhat different. When he was about to return to Armenia to inherit the kingdom, he found out that it was not going to be an easy feat. The Parthian king demanded from him 70 valleys, which his grandfather, Artashis I, had conquered from the Medes. These valleys were comprised of the regions of Caspia, Phonitis, and Perso-Armenia. Tigran returned to Armenia at a mature age. He had seen a lot and realized many things. He had come to learn a great deal about his neighbors, and this was to be a great opportunity when someone with such experience would inherit his father's throne. After returning to his homeland, Tigran was crowned in a place which was neither its capital or the spiritual center. This was a place where about two decades later, Tigran would establish his empire's new capital city of Tigranakert. This means that even prior to his return to Armenia, Tigran had planned out the establishment of his new empire and had contemplated the approximate borders of this vast domain and the new imperial capital would have to be in its geographic center. Now, 
Takavur Darnalov and Michapes said Irakanas Nel Razmakan Barepohumne. After becoming king, Tigran immediately began military reforms, which were initiated in the second century BC by Artashes I. He placed an emphasis on the striking capability of his armed forces and thus established heavily armored cavalry units. Tigranes did not overlook the importance of the infantry as well. This was contrary to the approach adopted by the Parthians, where the infantry played a secondary role compared to the cavalry units. This strategy was also contrary to the policy of the Romans, where infantry played the paramount role and the cavalry was relegated to a trivial function. In mountainous terrain, where the movement of cavalry troops was virtually impossible, the infantry's purpose was of the utmost importance, since in such locale, only the latter was able to conduct a full-fledged and prolonged battle. Thus, in the mostly alpine terrain of the Armenian highland, an Iranian plateau, Tigran needed an efficient infantry which could take upon itself the brunt of the battle and score decisive victories against its adversaries. When Rome and Parthia were trying to divide the Near East amongst themselves, whether by calculation or coincidence, an alliance was formed among Pontus and Greater Armenia. The initiative was undertaken by the Pontic Kingdom after Tigran the Great united the Armenian Kingdom of Sophene with the rest of Armenia, a move that caused the admiration of Mithridates Eupator, who afterwards sought to forge a close alliance with the Armenian king whom he regarded as his most important ally. Mithridates Eupator, probably around 111 BC, found refuge in the kingdom of Lesser Armenia, which during this time was ruled by King Antipatris. The latter was airless, and after seeing the talent and the potential of Mithridates Eupator, decided to name him as his heir apparent. Thus, Mithridates at first became an Armenian king, that is to say, the king of the Kingdom of Lesser Armenia and Armenia Minor, and was only proclaimed as the king of Pontus afterwards. Mithridates never regarded himself as the conqueror of Lesser Armenia. To the contrary, he felt stronger here than in Pontus proper. He kept his royal treasures in some 75 fortresses that he erected throughout Armenia Minor, which indicates that Mithridates Eupator gave primacy to this land. The historian Eutropius named Mithridates Eupator as the king of Pontus and Armenia. After undertaking several reforms within the kingdom, Tigran the Great in 93 BC and once again in 91 BC, in an alliance with Mithridates Eupator, carried out several conquests throughout Asia Minor. The two allies had reached an agreement according to which the conquered land would pass into possession of Mithridates Eupator, while all of the war spoils, including movable valuables, animals, and prisoners of war, would be transferred to the kingdom of Greater Armenia. Essentially, the initial conquests of Tigran the Great, which included the reunification of Sophene with the rest of Armenia and the campaigns in Cappadocia, provided economic supplies and manpower for future conquests. After also conquering Albania and Iberia, which took place during a decisive period, Tigran completely secured the northern, eastern, and western frontiers of Greater Armenia. It is important to note that, as a rule, the Armenian king placed garrisons in these conquered countries. 
This is also true much later, in the 3rd and early 4th century, as the military register of the Kingdom of Armenia notes that a special 4,000-strong Armenian garrison was stationed in the kingdoms of Albania and Iberia, which are called conquered countries. In July to August of 87 BC, for about a month, Halley's Comet could be seen in the Armenian sky. This exceptional appearance was seen as a sign of providence and a symbol of good fortune. This coincided with Tigran's Parthian campaign, which was launched that same year and set the foundation for the rise of the Armenian Empire. A few dozen of Tigran the Great's surviving coins feature on his crown Halley's Comet as a symbol of good fortune. This is a sharp difference to the much more common eight-pointed star flanked by two eagles, which is featured on most of Tigran the Great's coins. Incidentally, the last time Halley's Comet appeared in the Armenian sky was on the eve of the Artsakh Liberation Movement. After the death of the Parthian king Mithridates II, one of his relatives, Gotarzes, who earlier had rebelled against him and carved out a separate state in Mesopotamia, was preparing to take the Parthian throne. It was at this moment that Tigran the Great quickly took action and launched the military campaign into Mesopotamia. A proper time and route was chosen for the campaign. The time chosen was right because the Parthian state was in turmoil due to the internal power struggle, which had greatly weakened that domain, which only a few decades before was at the peak of its power. The chosen route was also right and was advantageous for the Armenian army for several reasons. The Armenian army crossed into Parthia through the 70 valleys which Tigran the Great earlier had to give up to the Parthians in order to return to Armenia and assume the throne as the new king. It must be noted that the Parthian kingdom during this time was the second most powerful state of the Near East, almost equal to that of Rome. Thus, this campaign for the Armenian side was not an easy feat. Tigran's strategy was that of a pinpoint attack, which caught the Parthians off guard. The Parthians were most probably expecting an attack through the region of Atropatene. However, after taking over all of the defensive fortifications in the area, Tigran moved the army to northern Mesopotamia. Here, near the ancient Assyrian capital of Nineveh, a decisive battle took place which resulted in a victory of the Armenian army over the main Parthian forces. It was impossible to resist someone who was well aware of the Parthian strategy and tactics, had cavalry that was just as powerful as the Parthian one, yet at the same time had a potent Armenian infantry, which was organized in the classical formation of the Falange, and the Parthians were not able to properly defend themselves against these formations. The Armenian army during its Parthian campaign initially marched southward and quickly shifted course towards the east. This was a tactical move designed to cut off the main communication routes between Atropatene and the rest of the Parthian kingdom. The Armenian army entered Greater Medea and reached Ekbatana which was the summer residence of the Parthian kings. The adjoining fortress of Adrabana was taken, and the Parthian kings were forced to sign a peace treaty on heavy terms. The most unique thing about this war was how short it was. The campaign lasted for less than a year, between 87 to 86 BC. In ancient times, such a short war was almost unheard of. 
During the peace talks with the Parthians, Tigran the Great, with few exceptions, demanded all of the territories that were conquered by the Armenian army. At the same time, the Parthian king willingly or unwillingly had to acknowledge his domain as part of Armenia's sphere of influence and had to give up the title of the King of Kings to the Armenian king. Furthermore, this was only the external aspect of the political situation that Parthia faced. Later developments would show that Tigran the Great's victory ushered in great changes inside Parthia. Soon, a new kingdom of Karasin arose within the Parthian domain, followed by Elamites, and this fragmentation within Parthia clearly indicated that it was not able to resist Armenia. The changes of fortune experienced by Tigranes were varied, for at first he was a hostage among the Parthians, and then through them he obtained the privilege of returning home. Therefore, as a reward, they received 70 valleys in Armenia, but when he had grown in power, he not only took these places back, but also devastated their country. Thus, within a matter of a few years, Tigran the Great became the King of Kings, and as such, attained the status of the most powerful ruler throughout the Near East. Armenia became the nucleus around which federative and confederative countries, kingdoms and dynasties banded together, a territory which stretched all the way to Lake Aral, the Hindus Valley and the Persian Gulf. Afterwards, the Armenian kingdom expanded in northern Mesopotamia. Gradually, the kingdom of Osroin was conquered, followed by the kingdom of Gordian, which was ruled by King Zarbinus, who later betrayed the Armenian king. Tigran the Great also conquered Komagin and was preparing to conquer the Seleucid Empire. The Armenian kingdom of Komagin, which was ruled by a branch of the Yervanduni dynasty, voluntarily accepted Tigran's rule, and Diochus Yervanduni, who rose to the throne of the kingdom of Komagin in 70 BC, is depicted wearing the same Armenian crown that was worn by Tigran the Great and other Armenian kings. The traditional Armenian crown is also depicted on the coins of the Kingdom of Komagin. The Kingdom of Komagin became a vassal of Rome in 66 BC and lasted until 72 AD. Tigran the Great planned to have a political and economic unification of all the Near East within a single state entity. In order to achieve this, he had to focus his attention and efforts on the Seleucid Empire. It should be noted that the conquest of Syria, which essentially was the core of the Seleucid domain, took place through very interesting and peaceful means, which has amazed scholars who have studied these events. The thing was, the Seleucid Empire during this time was being rocked by an internal crisis and a vicious power struggle for the control of the throne. The people, as well as the elites, were looking for someone who would bring stability to the war-torn country. Disappointed in their own local rulers, they were looking for someone from outside. After the kings and kingdom of Syria had been exhausted by unintermitting wars, occasioned by the mutual animosities of brothers and by sons succeeding to the quarrels of their fathers, the people began to look for relief from foreign parts and to think of choosing a king from among the sovereigns of other nations. Some therefore advised that they should take Mithridates of Pontus, others Ptolemy of Egypt. The thoughts of all were directed to Tigranes, king of Armenia, who, in addition to the strength of his own kingdom, was supported by an alliance with Parthia and by a matrimonial connection with Mithridates. Tigranes, accordingly, being invited to the throne of Syria, enjoyed a most tranquil reign over it for 18 years, without having occasion to go to war, either to attack others or to defend himself. Tigran the Great crossed the Euphrates and entered Antioch. 
All of this was achieved peacefully, since Antioch itself was very much interested in Tigran's arrival. Tigran took control of all the strategically important trade roads, which was also preferred by the Seleucids themselves. Thus, this is an extraordinary case for the ancient world, where the conquered side asks the conqueror to establish control over its territory. From the first glance, Tigran was not qualified to rise on the Seleucid throne as its savior, since he was not a member of the Hellenic royalty that hereditarily ruled the Seleucid Empire and did not have a cultural or ethnic bond with the people of Syria. In 93 BC, and again in 91 BC, the Armenian army, with its Pontic ally, entered Cappadocia and conquered the country. According to the agreement, the immovable property passed into Pontic hands, while all the movable goods became part of the Armenian war spoils. This also included not only the animals of the land, but also about 100,000 inhabitants who were transported to the Kingdom of Greater Armenia. The safe transport of such a vast quantity of people was naturally the task of the Armenian army. If the Armenian army had developed a bad reputation through immoral conduct that would certainly reflect negatively on Tigran's prestige and would not make it possible for him to be the preferred candidate of the Seleucid elites who invited him to their throne. Tigran had already decided to conquer the seashore in the eastern and northeastern sections of the Mediterranean Sea Basin. There was certain resistance against Tigran's takeover by some of the important cities and ports that were active in sea trade with other centers adjoining the Mediterranean Sea. However, the Armenian army was able to, one by one, take over these important cities and ports. After conquering the cities of the eastern Mediterranean sea basin, including cities such as Laodice and Beirut, Tigran the Great granted them local self-rule. These cities, which received wide autonomy, were grateful to the Armenian king and as a sign of gratitude adopted a new calendar starting with the year 81 BC, the year that these cities were incorporated into the domain of Tigran the Great, but with local administrative rule. The cities were also allowed to mint their own currency, which also featured the new calendar count starting with that year. At the same time, the Armenian armies defeated in the south the Nabataean and Judean kingdoms. About this time, news was brought that Tigranes, the king of Armenia, had made an eruption into Syria with 500,000 soldiers and was coming against Judea. This news, as may well be supposed, terrified the queen and the nation. Accordingly, they sent him many and very valuable presents as also ambassadors, and that as he was besieging Ptolemies. For Selene the queen, the same that was also called Cleopatra, ruled then over Syria, who had persuaded the inhabitants to exclude Tigranes. So the Jewish ambassadors interceded with him and entreated him that he would determine nothing that was severe about their queen or nation. He commended them for the respects they paid him at so great a distance and gave them good hopes of his favor. The Armenian king's supremacy was also acknowledged by the Arab tribes of the Persian Gulf. Tigran the Great's rule was also recognized by the states and tribes that lived on the banks of Central Asia's Oxus River. Thus, through these conquests, a vast state had taken shape which encompassed a territory of three million square kilometers.
From a small and inconsiderable beginning, he, Tigranes, had gone on to be the conqueror of many nations, had humbled the Parthian power more than any before him, and filled Mesopotamia with Greeks, whom he carried in numbers out of Cilicia and Cappadocia. He transplanted also the Arabs who lived in tents from their country and home, and settled them near him, that by their means he might carry on the trade. He had many kings waiting on him, but four he always carried with him as servants. Tigran's domain reached Egypt through Syria and Palestine, as well as the Hindu Kush and the Indus Valley. In the south, it reached the Persian Gulf and the Indian Ocean, and in the north, the Caucasus Mountains, the Black Sea, and the domain of his Pontic ally, Mithridates Eupator in Asia Minor. At one point, Mithridates Eupator wanted to establish his political influence in Egypt, yet it was Tigran the Great who afterwards was able to establish his influence by placing Ptolemy XII on the Egyptian throne. If the Armenian domain under the leadership of Tigran the Great lasted a bit longer, Egypt too would find itself within the borders of the vast Armenian state. Additionally, Tigran the Great was able to extend his control over the pirates who were active throughout the Mediterranean Sea and its coastline. The pirates had established a firm presence on the Cilician coast and stretched further westward. The pirates naturally were a power of their own and were not directly under the rule of the Armenian king. However, directly or indirectly, their attacks against the Romans were helping Tigran. Finally, the most important aspect of the new Armenian Empire was the establishment of the new capital of Tigranakert. This was due to the fact that the new empire required a new capital, since the old capital of Artashat was now geographically located not in a relative center, but on the periphery of the Armenian state. Tigran the Great's second capital after 83 BC was Antioch, the capital of the Seleucids, which of course was outside of the Kingdom of Greater Armenia. Tigran the Great was never planning to proclaim Antioch or any other large city outside of Armenia proper as his new capital. The Patriot Emperor knew that he should build the new capital of his empire on the Armenian soil, for he knew that someone who loves his native land builds his home on his native soil. Tigran the Great built his capital at the place where he was crowned in 95 BC when he returned to Armenia. He surrounded it with walls 25 meters high and wide enough to contain stables for horses. In the suburbs he built a palace and laid out large parks, enclosures for wild animals and fish ponds. He also erected a strong castle nearby. A new capital of Tikranakert that was erected was one of the largest of its time. Its outer walls alone were more than 25 meters high, which would be an equal of today's eight-story building. Tigran Oserta contained many treasures and rich offerings dedicated to the gods. For every ordinary man and nobleman, due to their love and respect for the king, were competing with each other for the expansion and beautification of the city. What are some of the unique aspects of civic construction during the reign of Tigran the Great? Here, interestingly enough, we see the development of dual cities. It is known that Tigran the Great connected the new capital city of Tigranakert through a royal road or highway with the old capital city of Artashan. 
We see this concept of dual cities, that is to say, two major cities connect with each other by a direct highway, only picking up later on. In the 19th century, we see this concept develop into connected cities, with dual centers of administration that are connected together. A number of authors believed that this was a 19th or even 20th century invention. However, we see the same form of civic construction during the time of Tigran the Great. It is known that Tigran built one of several Tigranikurts named after him on the southern foothills of Mount Masias. A number of scholars rightly identify it with the ancient site that was called Tel Arman or Tel Armeni. The king also built another Tigranikurt, which is located between the Zugma River Pass and Olaberia. It is believed that Tigran also built two more Tigranikurts in the Utik and Artsakh provinces of Armenia. Tigran most probably built two more cities named after him, one of which is noted in Ptolemy's geography as Tigranoma, which most probably is the Greek version of Armenian Tigranovan. This city was located southeast of Lake Ermia. The other Tigranovan built by the Armenian king was located in the present territory of the Autonomous Republic of Nakhchivan. Thus, Tigran, like other Hellenistic kings, wanted to immortalize his name and deeds by erecting numerous cities that were named in his honor. The capitals of the ancient world were most often also the religious centers. However, this was not the case with Tigranakert, which was not a religious center, but only an administrative one. That is to say, a vast empire that was created by Tigran the Great needed to have a capital city that would become its administrative center. Tigran the Great's empire, naturally, differed from the state structure that existed before and after him in the Kingdom of Greater Armenia. Tigran the Great's power was absolute. His will was the law of the land. With one command, he could destroy or build cities. However, the ancient traditional land council, which was made up of various strata of population, also continued to exist and exercised certain powers. There were also various branches of the royal court, which were made up by various elites and were in charge of different socio-political and administrative affairs of the land, which in turn also wielded certain amounts of power and influence. Unfortunately, we do not know the specific divisions of these royal agencies during the time of Tigran the Great. However, we do know the structure that existed later on during the reign of King Arshak II. The sources mention that during the royal festival, 900 representatives of the various royal agencies would sit and dine together. Though this does not take into account many others who also attended these gatherings and would stand on foot. One of the most important offices was that of the royal chancellor, who was first and foremost in charge of the economy. There were four main military commanders who were in charge of the four military themes that were located at four cardinal directions. Above them, as the supreme military commander of the land, was the king himself. Neither was his boldness to be accounted wholly frantic or unreasonable when he had so many nations and kings attending him and so many tens of thousands of well-armed foot and horse soldiers about him. He had 20,000 archers and slingers, 55,000 horses, of which 17,000 were in complete armor. As Lucullus wrote to the Senate, 150,000 heavy-armed men, drawn up partly into cohorts, partly into phalanxes, 
besides various divisions of men appointed to make roads and lay bridges, to drain off waters and cut wood, and to perform other necessary services to the number of 35,000, who, being quartered behind the army, added to its strength and made it the more formidable to behold. The office of the Supreme Judge was most probably held by the High Priest. There was also a special post for a nobleman who crowned the king during his enthronement. The royal bodyguard of the king, contrary to an opinion held by some, was made up of not 6,000, but of 10,000 elite soldiers. This can be verified by the military registry of the Kingdom of Armenia. Of course, there were other positions, which one can assume through an educated guess. This would have to include common posts like chief emissary, lord mayor, or the one who supervised the cities of the kingdom, chief of winery, and others. The third Mithridatic War took place between 73 to 71 BC and which resulted with Mithridates Eupator's defeat at the hands of the Romans. Mithridates retreated to Armenia. The Roman general Lucullus sent a delegation asking for the handover of his foe. However, Tigran the Great not only did not hand over his ally and father-in-law, but did not rush to return to Armenia as he was busy with state affairs in southern Phoenicia. Tigran the Great, through his scouts, had learned that the Roman Senate did not approve Lucullus's war against Tigran the Great, sovereign of the East. News reached Tigran that Lucullus had invaded Armenia. This was unaccepted since it was not acceptable for the Roman side to enter a vast domain without proper preparation. The latter developments came to prove this supposition. The Romans were not ready to conquer Armenia and were never able to absolutely conquer Armenia for centuries to come. Let us briefly look at the course of events that happened during this time. As soon as Tigran the Great heard the unexpected news of Lucullus' invasion, he rushed a vanguard force to Armenia. Rome had never declared war on Armenia and was not preparing to do so. The capital city of Dikranakert was also besieged when Tigran the Great with 6,000 of his elite royal cavalry reached it. This relatively small force was able to accomplish a great military objective. The royal cavalry bodyguard cut through the Roman lines which were besieging the city, entered the capital and was able to evacuate from there the queen, other members of the court and the treasury. This brilliant military move shows the potency of the Armenian army and also indicates how the later battle of Tikranakert, which took place on October 6, 69 BC, as described by Roman historians, is exaggerated by the latter in their favor. It is true that during the first main clash with the Armenian army was not in favor of the latter. Lucullus was also able to bribe some of the foreign mercenaries that were supposed to defend the capital from within. The mercenaries treasonously opened the gates from within. This was a major mistake by the King of Kings, who placed his trust on a force of outside mercenaries who were not motivated enough to defend the city and betrayed him at the first opportunity. Lucullus decided to continue his offensive. All along the march, the Armenian army would engage the Romans in skirmishes. The Armenian cavalry, headed by Tigran the Great, also struck in the most unexpected circumstances. The Roman formations were not prepared for such lightning assaults. The Roman scouts were also not proficient enough in this region to properly report on Armenian army maneuvers. This is why Lucullus decided that crossing the Aratsani River was not a bad idea, which in turn resulted in the Battle of Aratsani. 
At the Battle of Aratsani, the Roman army suffered a heavy defeat. The Roman historians who wrote on behest of the Roman Senate are not objective and present this defeat as simply the desire of their soldiers to return back to Rome. This is as absurd as the claim by a Roman historian that at the Battle of Dicronicert, the Romans lost only five men and the Armenian side lost 155,000. This simply does not make sense in light of the fact that only a 6,000 strong Armenian detachment was able to completely break Roman ranks, get into the city and rescue the queen and other members of the court and the treasury. Interestingly enough, Armenian primary sources did not believe that Lucullus achieved the significant results during his invasion of Armenia. Horenazi, the 5th century Armenian historian, simply notes that some ruffian by the name of Vikan had invaded Armenia during this time, and Tigran returned to the country and chased him out. Lucullus, due to the fact that he was defeated in Armenia, was removed from office and the Roman Senate in his place sent another general, Pompey. By the end of 67 BC and the beginning of 66 BC, a new alliance geared against Armenia and Pontus was formed between Rome and Parthia. The new allies reached an agreement whereby Pompey would march against Pontus, while the Parthian troops would march against Armenia. Pompey was able to defeat Mithridates Eupator, and the latter escaped from his kingdom. Mithridates this time retreated to his son's kingdom of Bosporus, which was situated in the present territory of Crimea. In 63 BC, Mithridates committed suicide. However, the Parthians who marched towards Artishad were not able to succeed and were crushed by Tigran's forces and retreated to their kingdom. Pompey and Tigranus began negotiations in order to reach a peaceful resolution. During the negotiations, the Armenian side was not giving in to their terms. Thus, the Armenian side was victorious. Tigran the Great was even able to conquer parts of Roman-controlled Galatia and had set up a buffer zone between his domain and that of Rome in order to win time in case there was an invasion of his domain. However, Tigran the Great decided to reach peace through certain compromise. This was mainly due to the fact that his Pontic ally was completely defeated and the Armenian king was now alone in his standoff against the united forces of Rome and Parthia. He could continue to resist in order to maintain his glory and power, for only a year before he had crushed the Roman forces of Lucullus and only months prior had once again defeated the Parthians. However, the new alliance between these two major powers of the ancient world had created a new reality by which Tigran now faced all all of the world, so to speak, since these two powers along with the Armenian Empire were the leading superpowers of the time, when the Armenian king had to decide between personal glory and his homeland's future and security, Tigran without any hesitation placed the interests of his country and people above all else. Tigran the Great gave up some of his conquests with the condition of maintaining complete sovereignty of the Kingdom of Greater Armenia. The Romans were thrilled by these terms and in turn wanted to do everything in their power in order to win the favor of the Armenian king. Roman history are biased in their presentation of some of the terms and details behind the treaty. However, it is evident that the Romans had to give up on their initial agreement with the Parthians of handing over to them Gordian and northern Mesopotamia. The Romans had turned down the Parthian request and did everything in their power to make sure that both of these territories remain part of Armenia. After the Treaty of Artashat, which was concluded in 66 BC, Tigran the Great concluded his war path and for the rest of his reign, which lasted for another 10 years, ruled peacefully and passed down the honorific and imperial title of the King of Kings to his descendants who succeeded him. Who was Tigran the Great and how did he view himself and his role? Tigran the Great was the descendant of the great ancient dynasties that ruled Armenia. He felt that not only was he the master of his own land and people, but more importantly, had a supreme duty, just like a father has duties and obligations when it comes to taking care of his family. Thus, Tigran the Great was one who deeply cared for the well-being of his people and country. This is why, during his time, Armenia truly reached unprecedented heights of development and progress. 
After becoming the emperor of a vast domain, Tigran the Great extended the same care and devotion to other peoples and countries outside of Armenia that were part of his empire. Many scholars have pointed out that Tigran the Great carried out a policy of tolerance and granted local self-rule to many people and cities that were now part of his empire. Tigran never trampled upon and always respected their ways, customs, languages and deities. In turn, Many of these people were in awe of Tigran and in their praise raised them to a level of deification. In the ancient site of Bavian in northern Mesopotamia, a relief of Tigran the Great made upon a cliff still survives. This relief was made in honor of his first victory against the Parthians. According to a German newspaper of the city of Augsburg, a relief of Tigran the Great along with a Greek inscription was found in Western Armenia in 1869. The British consul of Trebizond wanted to send the relief to the British Museum, but the relief disappeared during the transportation. When the Russian ambassador asked the Turkish authorities why they are blocking the efforts of the British consul in having the historic artifact transported to London, the Turkish Grand Vizier replied that they have orders from the Sultan himself to destroy all artifacts that would remind the Armenians of their heroic past. This fate also fell to a helmet that was found from Cappadocia, which bore the inscription Tigran, King of Armenia, the year 5571 of creation. In 1893, this helmet was sent to Constantinople and was never heard of ever since. Fortunately, in 1908, two French scholars, Jerifignan and Jalabert, had published this important inscription. The excavations of the old capital city of Artashaz began in 1970. Till today, we are still uncovering new archaeological evidence and materials which greatly help us to better understand some of the events that took place during that time. From 1990 to 1994, imbued with the spirit of Tigran the Great, Armenian freedom fighters were able to liberate some of the regions of northeastern Armenia. In 2006, archaeologists found one of the great cities built by Tigran the Great, the city of Tigranikert in the Armenian province of Artsakh. Tigran the Great rose to the throne 2100 years ago and within only 25 years expanded the borders of Armenia tenfold. His spirit and name became the eternal sojourners of his people. He proved to the world that it is possible to be a king of kings and remain pious. He was the patriot king, Tigran the Great.